Hey, Gabriel Blake. Hey, Gabriel Jose. Where are we today? I am in the same spot I am 99% of the time on my couch in San Francisco. I like that you don't even move against. No, no. The other side of the couch is my husband's spot. I guess I could go to the armchair. All right, next time, arm. <laughs> Is that our whole world is going to be upside down on the next recording? It's going to sound different. Our opinions are going to be like more poignant, you know. Maybe I'll be less be... pessimistic. Sadly. Uh, and yeah, I'm in Chicago as always. Uh, now we're having like a nice 80 degrees summer. No, it's fine for here, I think. I don't know what it is. I didn't go outside today, but it's 76 inside my apartment. That's pretty crazy. Honestly. It was crazy. Yeah. Uh, but talking about crazy, what did we watch this time? So this was my pick. And honestly, we took a, a week off. So I can't remember why I picked this, but I picked the 1991 seminal horror classic, Silence of the Lambs, or The Silence of the Lambs, directed by Jonathan Demme. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't remember why did you pick it? What was the last thing we talked about? Uh, we talked about nope, nope. Maybe we just wanted to watch a good horror film. <laughs> I think so. I think that you actually were like pretty burned out from it, and you wanted to just like have something that the quality was going to be supposedly good. By the way, just one note about nope. I my brother-in-law is incredibly knowledgeable about cinema, and I texted him. And I was like, did you see this and did you like it? He did like it. On a scale of 1 to 10, he gave it an 8. And I said, you're going to have to explain it to me sometime. I didn't get it at all. And he's like, well, it worked for me. At least he tried to do something original. <laughs> so that was the entire text exchange. <laughs> but I don't think that it was that or you know. No? Dion gets on a boat. Is also original. Still not good. <laughs> all right no that's fair that's fair uh in any case we are not here for just like beating a dead horse this is not the touring horse is it oh so good just tired <laughs> uh but uh as you mentioned we wanted to see like something of horror so as this was your pick i should actually try to summarize like this classic that i think that everyone has watched at it's some point old at this point is how old 31 Oh my god, yeah, that's yeah, a bit uncanny. I remember when this movie came out and it was like just pretty young. I remember like just hearing like just people talking about it and just thinking that this has to be the most scary thing ever created. It's still pretty disturbing 31 years later, like nah. Let's talk about like what is it about. Uh, <laughs> so the uh, the movie follows uh, John Cadet uh, of the FBI about to graduate, Clarice Sterling, played by Jodie Foster, and how she is uh, tasked with the mission of going to interview one of the most famous uh, serial killers in the States, uh, Hannibal the Cannibal played by Anthony Hoskins, that is an, in a mental institution, in a high security prison, uh, and usually doesn't like visits too much. And he's like famous for actually just like killing and eating some of his former patients. Were they all of his patients? I don't think so. Well, they I were like people close to him. Yeah, they were like close to him in some kind of way. Um, but the story, I'm going to be like just simplifying like some parts. But yeah. yeah, basically there is another another serial killer on the loose, uh, Buffalo Bill, I think it was called. And uh, at the end, we discover that uh, Clarence Clarice was tasked without knowing uh, to talk with Anthony Hawkins to try well, with a uh, Hannibal for actually like, trying to figure it out like the identity of Buffalo Bill. So helping like the real investigations. There are like multiple like twists and turns about like uh, Hannibal like giving the wrong information, Hannibal like developing some kind of sympathy mentorship relationship with Clarice and some tension in there. Uh, there is, they move Hannibal at some point. 
if I recall correctly, with some kind of promise that he would be like just moved to a better prison where he could see a tree from his window and having access to books. Yeah, so, so Buffalo kidnapped the senator's daughter, mm. and they knew that he had three, that Buffalo Bill kept the women alive for three days. So the senator said, "I'll get you a better prison if you help us find him." So he gets. Was he alive? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, spoiler alert: at the end, he's like Anthony. Well, Hannibal was like playing everyone, basically, and he ends up like just escaping, while at the same time, like Jodie Foster Clarice. Uh, ends up fighting, finding almost by mistake, Buffalo Bill. <laughs> in a bit of a random way about like, okay, there has been like an investigation, some reasoning, and then at the end, like way of discovering it is like a bit more about like, hey, this girl that disappeared used to deliver packets to this address. And she goes to that address and it's a serial killer. <laughs> it's like... Well, no, I the, re the way she got there was she found those photos the sexy Polaroids that the, mm. the dead girl had hidden. She went and talked to her best friend and said, was she fucking anyone? She's like, no, but she used to sew and deliver packages to this woman's house all the time. It was a man, no? It was a man's house, like an old man's house. I thought it was for Mrs. Lip, Lip I, something. I don't know. No, no, something. I mean, I, I, I watched this movie like almost three weeks ago. <laughs> so I, I'm going to be forgetting like some of those, uh, those details. Um, that's pretty much it. They rescue the girl, happy end, secret awaits, but Hannibal actually escapes. So we can have like more movies that they happen. No, it, it, the, it was a trilogy of books. And and th this was the second book they skipped that, the first. That's true, that's true. Because actually we talk about like the first adaptation of the first book, if I recall correctly, that it was Manhunt, no man. Manhunter, and then they remade it as Red Dragon. Correct. Yeah. And the third one was Hannibal. Oh, Julian Moore was so good in that. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me get like something out of the way. Uh, we discussed a bit about it um, before we started recording, but something that I couldn't shake off my head is like how age from a cinematography perspective, from a filmmaking perspective, this movie feels. It definitely feels closer to the 80s than I would like it to feel. Yeah, it feels like very stiff and using like some tropes that by nowadays standard, they feel something that you will make as a parody of the genre. What are you talking about? Sorry. I mean, it feels aged, but it's 31 years old. The thing is, like, you know, if it's something from the 60s or 70s, is like you look at it as a bit more of, or at least I look at it a bit more as like just this kind of uh, permissiveness about like, look, it was a different time, you know, like things were made in a different way, maybe society was different. When I look at some cinema from the 80s and 90s, I just feel it's like they were doing cinema wrong. There was something that they were not like thinking properly when actually just making these movies. Just and that's the reason. Of cinematography and the kind of 80s aesthetic. But not only that aesthetic, but it's a bit more about like how to shoot like some of the scenes. It's like I think that Anthony Hawkins does a really good job as Hannibal. Judy Foster, I'm not completely sure that I like her that much as Clarice. I, I, liked not... her, I liked her in this role. I felt like yeah. it was uh, uptight, but. Yeah. I'm, I'm like a bit debating, you know, but everyone else feels like a caricature. There is something that I feel like with secondary characters in the in the cinema during those decades is that they just feel like placeholders and play. The black best friend that was in like thirty seconds of the film, I was like, "What, really?" <laughs> yeah, or you know, like the uh, like the uh, director of the prison. Oh, he's yeah. a creep. Is the guy? It, it, it's just. No, no, I know all these characters, even like the mentor on the FBI. I was like, it's like, I don't know if there is like something like going on, some kind of uh, creepiness to all of the men on this, or it's just like everything was written with a different mindset back then. Yeah, I definitely got creepy vibes off the FBI guy, um, but I did find interesting, and I had never really noticed this before 
even though it's so obvious I should have, but like she lost her dad was her favorite person in the entire world. Yes, it and was. he yeah, he was a marshal a uh, sheriff's marshal. I said it was Marshall, yeah, 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 you're right. Um and she lost him at ten, I think. He he was killed by some burglars. And she's clearly looking for father figures. <laughs> and you can tell that there's this dichotomy of like uh, the virgin and the whore, except the serial killer and the FBI director. Yeah. <laughs> she's attracted deeply to Bull, but you can sense she's attracted more to Hannibal. It's very weird. It's very like Oedipal, except, you know, I don't know. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it reads by nowadays a standard weird. It feels like this script would have written, would have been written in a very different way by nowadays standards. There were some things that stood out to me as way too absurd to be true. I mean, it's not even realistic. Like, when they move Hannibal to the nicer prison, it's basically like... A if it's from a superhero stuff. movie... There's like 60 police in the lobby, but only two next to his prison, and it's in this enormous palatial room with paintings. But not just that. I I think the way Hannibal escapes is brilliant, because for anyone who kills the two guards, rips the face off one, covers it over his own, and so they take him out of an ambulance. That's that's like a cool way to escape. <laughs> but, like, when the police run into this enormous... Oh, room, wait, wait a second. So is it... You think... This is not like a bit far-fetched that, is that you can actually replay the face of someone, you know, like, put it on top of yours, and they would take you in an ambulance, and none of the paramedics would actually just change about, like, hey, why is there blood on his face, on his neck? He's like, oh, there is a fake fucking face. I I buy it. I can, <laughs> I can understand if you can't, but I like, I like that plan, but... <laughs> I like that plan as a caricature, or so actually, like, straight from a Marvel comic. But the fact that he supposedly in this rush to escape where he had to remove somebody's face, he took the time to string up the other officer over his prison <laughs> about his innards and it's and and then change all the lights so the lights are hitting him. I was like eh. No, dude. I mean the thing is like a what I feel is like look, this probably comes out of being more of a weakness of the source material. You know, that is the source. I'm sorry, dude. It's like everything feels like so far fetched. That's the reason why I was asking you about Seven. Because from the filmmaking perspective, what I remember about Seven is like this feels modern. This feels like, at least from the last time that I saw it, that it was like also like six, seven years ago, you know, but it felt like this is still good. This is still like a good movie. Or, you know, even if you actually watch Zodiac, I feel like it's in a different league from this. Yeah, but you can't compare, like, Zodiac was made what? Well, I guess Zodiac's like, what? 20 50? years almost? Yeah. 20? I mean, I was, no, no, it cannot be 20, it cannot be 20, but it, 2007, it's like 15. Wow. No, I mean, I liked this movie a lot, but I did see a lot of problems. I, yeah. I mean, honestly, I told you before we started, I bought the movie. Because I said, it's like, oh, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to be like watching it again. It's like, this was such an enjoyable experience. This was the third time that I was watching it. And for me, this time, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> like at the end, when they actually just found like, wait, a, wait, because I was thinking, it's like, there is only like 20 minutes. What was like the reasoning for, oh, 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 okay. I also had a rough time with Buffalo Bill's, like, enormous maze of a basement with like brick walls that had holes in it and I was like yeah. uh, there like there like multiple things that when you stop and think about them it's like do someone it's fine that the book is like this. It's fine. It's absolutely fine. It's a book. It's like a bestseller book is just designed for being enjoyable. But if you're going to be adapting it into a movie and you want to make it feel realistic, it's like you have to change half of this. So I, deep inside me, I'm wanting to, to, to defend the book. Did you read it? I did, but I was 18. Oh. <laughs> so, so that was like five years ago. I don't really I know. know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Too much alcohol and drugs in between. <laughs> um, I read all three books, as I recall. Oh. In fact, I, uh, 
my university wouldn't let you take tests if you had an overdue book from the library and I had I had read Red Dragon was like five days overdue so I couldn't take a test oh my god <laughs> that's, that's a very mean thing to do they also wouldn't let you take a test if you hadn't shaved that day so, oh well yeah you told me the one yeah that's yeah. even meaner BYU good for you <laughs> uh, but but wait so you didn't find this an enjoyable experience I it got to a point that it jumped the shark for me, you know, and I was like a bit more like, can I take this seriously? Am I supposed to take it seriously? I got to actually ask myself, I don't remember like, the last time that I watched it, I think that I was it like once in Spanish like, a long time ago, and then I wanted to see as yes, there are like so many one-liners famous from this, especially on the conversations with uh, with Jodie Foster and Anthony Hawkins, that is like, I want to see this in English, and I remember liking it and saying like, this is saying well, but this time I felt like so out of it, it felt so silly. I think that there has been like such an explosion on serial murder content. Do you know that is like if I compare this with Mind Hunters, for example, like the tension that I feel in Mind Hunters, I didn't feel it here. I honestly didn't. That's interesting because I I was watching <laughs> I was watching this movie right up until I had to pause it to go to therapy and I remember like going into my therapy session and I was super tense and like I was like on edge and I was like oh wow I'm impressed with this is still working no 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 I it, it didn't work for me man. I mean I, you know, and I remember like the first like, the, the previous times that I was there is like was like really like buying into it but I don't know if maybe it was my mindset or maybe it was a bit more of all like from the beginning as I approach it was a bit more is a dude this accent for Jody Foster this FBI that it looks like a I don't know like a spirits uh it's called a spirit like the Halloween warehouse shops it's like a reconverted spirit into an FBI <laughs> office everything felt so poor <laughs> you know that I felt like I had to do like a big suspension of disbelief and I was not expecting to do you know who Chris Isaac is uh no I don't think so she was very famous in the early 90s as a singer. Um, you would know some of his songs. David Lynch likes him. Oh, anyway, for whatever reason, he was an, he was like a, he did cameos in a lot of things. And for whatever reason, I recognized him this time. And he was the leader of the SWAT team that went into Hannibal Lecter's prison. And I was like, you can't just put like a pop star and expect not to take me out of the scene. Like, I'm just thinking about Chris Isaacs now. Isaac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, I didn't recognize him. You know, like probably, did, did he even have a line? He did, yeah. He he's, but it was something like, "Get ready, men, let's go." Okay. And then he talked on his uh, on his microphone inside, and he was covered in sweat. And I was like, "How did they get everyone to look like they were sweating at one time?" <laughs> I I don't know. And do, there was like something else that I felt like got this got me out like so quickly. Like they see with the back and forth with uh, Clarice and, uh, and Hannibal on the prison that you have like the, the class. Yeah, yeah, like the first visit, you know, that she's like standing back, you know, like a bit about like, I don't know what to expect of this. They have, I know that they're like, I'm very picky about this, but I hate when you can see the smoke and mirrors of cinema and you can actually see like, hey, these action reaction shots that you are seeing, is that you can just identify that they were recorded like all in a row, you know, it's like, okay, Jodie Foster, read all your lines and she reads all the lines and then they actually is Anthony Hawkins on the other side and you can see that they didn't move, there is no kind of fluidity to the image, you know, to the conversation. Did you know that um, they hadn't met before that scene and they never spoke to each other while they were filming? Oh, so nice. Foster could be afraid of him like not humanize him that's creepy i i but hear your sense. complaints but what what bothered me about that scene is everyone was like don't get near the glass 
don't get near the glass and she doesn't and then she's walking out and Migs, his next door cell neighbor <laughs> throws cum on her face and he's like Clarice come back come back and she runs right up to the glass and they're pressing next to each other and they start talking for a second and then does he keep a towel there? That's the next scene where she just comes to visit him in the middle of the night, all the lights are off, and she's just leaning up against his glass, and he doesn't say anything, but then the drawer opens, and there's a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Not a tissue, like a, a cloth. Mm. What's that called? Handkerchief. Yeah, handkerchief, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it, it basically, Judy Foster, like Clarice, for just being an FBI trainee, it's impressive how quickly she actually just broke all the law, all the rules that she was given. <laughs> also, what I find frustrating about cinema this old, not that 31 years is that old, but like this age and older, I can't tell the age of people and whether or not they're supposed to be beautiful or unattractive because Jodie Foster looks like she's 38 in this film. And I'm like, wait, she's like 21, 22? <laughs> yeah, you know that's fine. <laughs> well, but Jodie Foster is weird. I think that she has like a two ages, basically. It's Taxi Driver and everything else of her career. <laughs> it yeah, doesn't matter if it's from the 90s or from nowadays. It's like, she still looks pretty young. You know, I think that she's 60 now. And it's like, she still looks... Oh, wow. She looks great for 60. Yeah, 59. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's true that she had like less wrinkles, you know, in that, in, uh, in this, but I don't see like so much of a difference between like contact and, uh, and how do you say, and, uh, and Sales of the Lambs. We should watch Contact. No, we shouldn't. Isn't it a good movie? No. I watched it last year because oh, I read not. the book. I, I read the book and then I watched the movie and I was like, eh, it's like the Hallmark version. <laughs> it's the Hallmark movie, but they have like something, I will send you a video later, they have a nice scene that is not like a special effects or like key scene or anything that is impressively made. That when you're watching it, you're like, how the fuck did they do that? I will send you a video because probably you remember that scene. It's like everyone that I talk uh, about this movie is like, oh, did you watch the scene? Everyone remembers that scene. Is it when she's in the giant machine? No. This okay. way before that. It's in a flashback a scene and she's like just running through the house as a kid. And there is like oh, a like mirror. In a, film, in a film class. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, yeah. And it's like when I saw it, I actually had to rewind and she's like, what just happened here? And not that high. Out, like it goes out onto the roof with her dad and they're looking at the stars. No, 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 no. She's it's when the father spoiler alert for contact. <laughs> so surprise. <laughs> surprise. Side spoiler alert. Uh, the father is having a heart attack and she's running to just get her uh, his meds. So she's running oh. to the bathroom. And then the mirror. Exactly. It's mirror. like the mirror that effect that is like, oh my god, we were in mirror wall. <laughs> I'm I'm a little bummed that uh, that it didn't work for you. It it worked for me with obviously I called out several things that irked me, but overall it, it was still effective, and I'm still afraid of Hannibal Lecter. I'm not that much. I mean, the thing is like they they paint him in such a unrealistic way that it doesn't it doesn't come across as human. Is it's just more of a caricature. It doesn't feel like a disturbed human. It feels like a superhero, a super villain. Also, because I've studied serial killers extensive, not not formally, but I've consumed all serial killer content for everything. Um, serial killers like him don't exist, except as sexual sadists. They don't just like eat their victims' liver with fava beans and a nice Chianti. Chianti, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll this is so weird. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh a bit about it when he said it. I'm like, wait, is that the right pronunciation of this? <laughs> that doesn't matter. Um, yeah, no, I felt I felt a bit disappointed in myself, especially after buying it because I was convinced about like, dude, I'm buying. Of course, it's like four bucks for renting and five bucks for buying it. Is that like, this is a steal? Is like I'm going to be like watching it next week for sure. And I felt like, like mm, no, <laughs> that's why well, you were wrong dodgy 
before we started recording, and I was like, "You'll watch this again in ten years," and you're like, "Let's start recording." Let's just start. Yeah, let's let's talk first. Let's talk first before like getting to good questions. So one, I didn't check this on Rotten Tomatoes. Two, I didn't read the New York Times, so maybe I didn't like this film. Um, <laughs> what do you think it has on Rotten Tomatoes? I check it out. I think that it was like a ninety or something. Or a ninety-five. Yeah, ninety-five. Yeah. Yeah, I check it out like when we were watching, it's like, wait, but the thing is that everyone loved it when it came out. And it's like, I don't think that it's a bad movie. I just got the feeling that if you look at it a bit more critical and you don't have like the good memories of this movie when it came out or, you know, like close to the to the release, I, I think that there has been like way better serial killers movies. Like, not Zodiac, name one. Zodiac. <laughs> Not Zodiac. Seven. One other. What? Seven. Do you think Seven is better than this? Yeah. Uh, seven is also like very over the top. Let's just be honest. So I watched, uh, just in preparation for this podcast, I watched about no, a little more than half of Seven. And I was like, did they just take the soundtrack from Silence of the Lamb and put it in this? It's like the exact same music. I have one for you. No Country for All Men. That's not a serial killer. He's, he's a about a serial killer. He he's won an Oscar for playing... No, he's, he was he's a serial mercenary. Killer. He does stuff for money. Serial killers do it for pleasure. Also, the American Psychiatric Association recently voted on the most accurate portrayal of a psychopath in all of cinema. And they chose that character from No Country for Mulvina. They think it's the most accurate portrayal of someone who's psychopathic. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. Oscar Worthy. Do you watch American Psycho? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I never watched it, so I have no idea. I a... enjoyed it, but it's more like a guilty, a stylish guilty pleasure. It's like the cell, but a little bit better. <laughs> uh, I like that. You, okay, there you go with Tarzan. <laughs> Wait, wasn't the cell actually like getting into the mind of a serial killer? It was. Oh my god. J Lo. J-Lo penetrated a serial killer's mind. <laughs> penetrated. Uh, wasn't there any other boy, any other work to do sometimes? <laughs> penetrated someone's mind. Um, I don't remember much when we watched uh, Mindhunter. I remember that we discussed about like, hey, we all remember The Silence of the Lambs as a really good movie. And this is not it. This is not at the level. Now I'm curious if I were to watch like Manhunter, if I felt is that there's not too much difference between these two. Well, let me pick Red Dragon next. Um, come Iwan on. It was Seymour McGregor? No. Philip Seymour Hoffman, Edward Norton, uh, Ray Fiennes, or am I mixing Hannibal? No, 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 that's all Red, Red Dragon. No, Ray Fiennes was in Hannibal? He. No, no, no. He's not in Hannibal. He's in Red Dragon. He is Red Dragon. Oh, yeah, that's right. Riley Otter, Gary Oldman, Julianne Moore wearing Hannibal. Yeah, that was not a good movie. And you know I like Julianne Moore. I know. I know you do. And it was terrible. I don't know if... No, I went to watch uh, Red Dragon. I think that I watched Hannibal online or whatever. Growing up, I wasn't allowed to watch rated R movies, but once you're 17, you can obviously go and buy them. And I bought Hannibal, and I hit it. <laughs> and it felt very subversive. <laughs> uh, the cast is good. I don't remember this movie being that good. And you know, Dragon, the... no. I mean, I, it's a solid horror film. Solid for a horror film is what I would say. From what I remember, I haven't seen it in years. So. It looks like there was a prequel on the book, for the book, called Hannibal Rising. Rising. Oh, yeah, I tried to read that, and it wasn't... It was like a cash grab. Uh, and I get it. If you have one of the most famous characters of all time, go for yeah. it. But it wasn't, it wasn't great. Did you ever oh, watch no, the they show? turned that into a movie! They also I turned just... it into a movie. 
and it's real bad. <laughs> I can't really have more too. That was a movie. Uh, I saw that in theaters, and I think it was PG thirteen. Oh my god! Okay. Cast for real? Yeah, the cast is. I don't know anyone. Yeah, as I recall, they were. Oh, Dominic West. Isn't it? The guy That's from a pretty a... good indicator. It's gonna be a piece of <laughs> shit. <laughs> it is Unless like the biggest a... name that you got. Yeah. Unless it's a uh, drug dealer TV show on HBO. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he was made for for playing, <laughs> like an Irish drunk, completely loser. Uh, there was the 2007. No, I didn't even know about this. He has a 16 in Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> oh, and that's generous, as I recall. Hmm. So, um, well, I'm very interested to hear our scores then, or not our scores. Answer the questions. Yeah, let's let's answer the questions. Uh, would you watch it again? Yes. When? I mean, I don't have like cable TV anymore, but in a year I would sit down and watch it probably. I will watch it again. But I will watch it again only because I pay for it and now I own it. <laughs> so it would be like out of a spite, out of a, okay, let's give it an older try. Maybe, maybe that was not the day for feeling good about this movie and just see if I actually can recommend it with that feeling. Uh, would you recommend it? Yeah. Would you say that? Would you just say that you recommend if someone asks you, tell me a serial killer movie? To be honest, I can't think of that many serial killer movies. Not even Psycho? Oh, he is. A, he kills a lot of women, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah, he wants I... to become a woman, like exactly the bad guy here, like in the. Uh, well, everyone said like that. Uh, I was actually happy that they um, that documentary just came out with trans actors or trans trans people talking about their experience, and they call out Silence of the Lambs as like being this is the first exposure as a man wanting to become a woman. But I was very happy that Jodie Foster called out um, transsexuals are actually pretty good people. This is not transsexualism. I was like, good for them. Like, good for them. Well, but I think that I saw the commentary. They actually were calling about psycho. Too, that is like actually they're like severe killers they actually portray or associate like just being trans with serial killers yeah they i mean the association is there but they did at least say this is not a transsexual this is a psychopath i'm like okay at least they said those words true they say those words but it's still like portray as someone who wants to become a woman yeah so you can say those words, but if your stories about like someone that wants to become a woman by killing women, that's not okay. Did you not find the shot where, and they show it extremely briefly, of the bodysuit on the mannequin? I was so disturbed by that. Oh, no. You know, you know that he's based on a real serial killer. Yeah. Uh, but. Wasn't there something similar also in uh, Manhunter? Did he want also to become a woman? The In the second season, the guy they spend all season leading up to and then they never address. No, 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 no. Oh, you're talking about Mind Hunter. I'm talking about Manhunter. Oh, Manhunter. The Red Dragon adaptation. I don't remember that movie that well, but in the in the other movie Red Dragon he just wants to metamorph into something grander but it's not a gender switch he wants to become a dragon from the William Blake paintings oh my god yeah that's right he was he was Rolfins mm -hmm. that's right I remember it now yeah I went to the scene it was this one it was not a good dude do you remember when Ray Fiennes bites off Philip Seymour Hoffman's lips and then ties him to a wheelchair, lights him on fire, and sends him down a hill. <laughs> what? <laughs> but yeah, actually, if you remember when we started recording from home, uh, I used to do as a joke, like just putting like a virtual background with one of the photographs from the movie. <laughs> and my photograph from Manhunter was, from Manhunter, was actually that, like just the actor, like just going in a flaming uh, wheelchair. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, at least they, they adapted like accurately, I guess. 
Mm-hmm. But yeah. Uh, would you remember? Oh, sorry. Uh, if I could recommend it, my answer is, I'm sorry, no. Seriously? But it's. I mean, if someone tells me, if someone asks me, is that hey, do you think that I should watch like Silence of the Lambs? I would say that, like, yeah, maybe. I mean, don't expect too much. So yes, you would recommend it with an asterisk. Sure. Okay, I go with just with an asterisk. I wouldn't recommend people to stay away from the movie, but at the same time, I don't think that it lives up to the high expectations that we have out of it after like so many years. I mean, I, I just feel like piece of the movie because I used to love it. And from my perspective, someone asked me about like, hey, serial killer movie? Is like, sure. Psycho. Uh, sorry. Seven. So interesting that I would never think of Psycho as a serial killer. I mean, it absolutely is, but it doesn't compute in my mind. And interesting. Yeah. But it's it's also another like horror movie. Yeah, and it's a very good one. Yeah, it's exactly like it's exactly the same genre that we use for describing these, like a horror serial killer movie. And also now that we recently watched it, um, what is that German, that like early twenties German movie about a serial killer? Oh, uh, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was one we watched before that. Oh, M. M. Yeah, M. I would definitely recommend M <laughs> before M. this. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Now I feel a bit bad. Because M, like, the interesting thing is centered on the character, on the serial killer. And all of this. And I think that Hollywood doesn't feel comfortable, like, just centering the story on the serial killer. What was that Johnny Depp movie where he played the investigator going after Jack the Ripper? Uh, from hell. From hell. We I never watched it. Watch it. I read the the comic. It made me really, really want to do absent. That show. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I swear the comic is good. It's a bit of a insanity of a uh, investigation that uh, Alan Moore did in there. Yep. Uh, let me just go back to the question. So, yes, with us, the risk about like I'm not going to be like deterring anyone from watching it, you know, but I'm not going to be like encouraging anyone either, you know. It's not like men that will be actively like do something else with your life. <laughs> uh, would you remember it? Yeah, uh, there were a few surprises, um, but also I wanted to tell you that, like, growing up in America in the 90s, if you had cable TV, this played nonstop on a million different network channels. So, like, I remembered a lot about this film. So this was, like, basically the NR18 version of uh, Jurassic Park? Yep. Yep. Because it was in NR18, no? It was only, like, for mature audience no i think it was rated r oh rated r okay yeah yeah yeah. r is before mature audience uh i think that i could remember it i had forgotten about like how they find the killer so i was expecting like the whole time but like okay how was he there was like some reasoning so that was like the only part that i felt like disappointed i was like are you well i felt like disappointed about all the stuff but that part i was like are you kidding me Seriously, <laughs> FBI is that this is how you get to the conclusion? Sure. Uh, is there anything artistic about it? Um, yeah. I mean, the performances are great. Uh, I know you didn't like Jodie Foster that much. I did. Um, and I would argue that the direction was very solid. It creeped me out when Buffalo Bill turns off the lights and she's in night vision. I. <laughs> The funny thing is, like, I knew of that scene way before watching the movie from when the movie was released. That some all some kids from my class they went to watch it, and they said, "Oh my God!" And at the end, he had like an eye vision. You know, like how many things he can see, but she cannot. Uh, I don't think that there is anything artistic about this movie. I think that is like the direction is like as functional as it gets. The acting, Anthony Hopkins does a good job, and Jodie Foster. It's okay, I cannot decide if I like her or not, but everything feels like so functional that it reminds me of the two faces of January. Let's go. Oh. <laughs> that is like, this is functional and forgettable. You crossed the line. Also, it's interesting to note that Reservoir Dogs came out one year after this. <laughs> I'm always down to watch it and we can just like compare the scripts if you want. 
Um, so this, I wanted to see, so this won five Oscars. What did it win? I think it won best movies. picture. Yeah, it did. Best actor, best actress, best director, and best writing. Hmm. Interesting. See, it was nominated and didn't win for best sound, and I would have given it best sound. The sound is good. I yeah. don't deny it, you know, but it's, I don't think that it's like a importance enough for us only just driving like the whole movie. Uh, is it a timeless piece? Yes. I would say yes, you know, I don't think that anything is going to change. The style of the filmmaking is like what irks me, but the story itself is still the same. Uh, would you turn this into a TV show? They did. I mean, Jonathan Dem basically did, right? With um, oh, that Super Bowl show based on the Danish show. You're welcome for being so specific. <laughs> what? <laughs> he, uh, I'm not going to be able to find it fast enough. No, I would not turn this into a uh, TV show. But you know, did you watch? Because I was going to be asking you about like the different people that they played uh, Hannibal. What did you think of uh, of Mark Nicholson? Of who? Matt Nicholson on the Hannibal TV show. I never saw it. Um, I know okay. who he is. I like that actor. In he's incredible in some. Yeah, another movies. one. Yeah, in some movies he's awful. The Killing. Did you see The Killing? Not yet. I have it on my queue, like for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I was the first season of it, and I just felt, nah, about like, does this really need to be a TV show? It does not. It was so boring that first season. I didn't even watch the rest of the seasons. Oh, you watched the first season of Hannibal? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was like forgettable for me. That redhead went to my college. <laughs> nice. Uh, so you said that you wouldn't turn it into a TV show? No. Yeah, I wouldn't either. I think there's like a good detective story, but just try to stretch it out into something like Mind Hunters or the Lies is that it couldn't work. Uh, do you think this movie could have been better? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Stay away from the glass, Clarice. <laughs> or I mean, just I, don't say that. I don't I understand the idea of wanting to portray the fascination that Clarice has with Hannibal, but it's the dude, she's going to be an FBA agent. She's supposed to be like the creme of the creme. You know, she's supposed to be like the impressive agent, the ultimate agent, and I honestly, as dumb as she gets. It was getting to be cheesy enough at the ending that as she... the. One of the final scenes when she walks across the stage to accept her badge at graduation, I thought, they're going to give her a standing ovation, aren't they? <laughs> and they did, no? No, they didn't. They just zoom in on her friend, the black friend that gets like 30 seconds of screen time and and she's cheering her on. Uh, I... No, I mean... God, it's so... Yeah, the, the filmmaking is so weird. That's... Uh, whatever. Um... Uh, so, before we score, this was your pick, so I'm going to be asking you if you can remember, if you can summarize in three sentences of each one of them, less than 30 words, Sinotech New York. What movie? Sinotech New York. I don't Charles Kaufman. remember. Charles Kaufman. Oh, Synecdoche, New York. Um, <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman plays an eccentric genius who wins a MacArthur grant to write his magnum opus, which is a play that's larger than life and as insane as Charles Kaufman's mind, which includes a house <laughs> that he uh, that Samantha Morton buys that is constantly on fire. Oh, God. Buys it knowing she's going to die of smoke, and the play gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And meta, meta, more and more and more meta. Yeah. It's How a was basically that? No, no, that's good. I mean, there were like more words that I expected, but basically, it's like it ends up like engulfing the whole world. And yeah. then the whole world like compresses itself. Yeah. 
it's I, I don't know why I started thinking about it today at the gym and I was like this is like a gothic cathedral like going too crazy I I don't think Synecdoche in New York was that good but it has never left my mind I don't know why and I saw it in theaters well because I think that there is nothing like it is that it's a bit more about like just giving like total freedom about, like do whatever the fuck you want and he going like completely insane in some direction that is that like, no one else could be able to do this and I think that there is like a lot of merit to that anyone else could have done the silence of the lab no one else by Charles Coleman could have done seen it in New York if you say so. I mean yes about <laughs> New York I think Jonathan Dem is a very talented director. He's a fine small director. Should we score the Sun of the Lambs? Yes, let's, let's, let's end this. Okay, as this was your speak, I had to score this. First, it's a 6.5. You really dampened my score, by the way. <laughs> sorry, dude. I'm sorry. I'm still going to give it a 7.5. This is a good film for me. I'm not saying that it's bad. But I don't know if I was watching a bad day, but it was like just pinpointing like all of the defects. And there were a couple of times that I laugh out loud. And I don't want to laugh out loud, you know, in horror <laughs> serial killer movies. That's fair. Uh, so, anything else to say about the Silence of the Lambs? No, I think I've said everything I have to say. <laughs> And I think that I say too too much about it. Uh, so for the next pick, as is mine, and it has been a really long time since we have watched anything animation. So I'm going to go with something that uh, Jordan Peele actually refreshed in my mind. That is Akira. That he did like a very blatant Easter homage, Easter egg homage, however you want to call it, to Akira. And this was a movie that I used to really like and I have been like insisting to watch it for a very long time I think alright let's do it all right. and to all of those people out there thank you so much for listening to us anything else? wash your hands at least <laughs> at least <laughs> bye <laughs>